Welcome to this lecture on comma rules. This week we will be focusing on two different comma rules, introduction fragments and commas in a series. So the first comma rule we're looking at is a comma after an introduction fragment. And this should sound familiar because one of the ways that we talked about connecting full sentences is breaking one of the full sentences into a fragment and hooking it to a full sentence. When we hook that fragment onto the front, we had to add a comma after the fragment. So the pattern that we have is introduction fragment, comma, full sentence. And a couple examples. When I found a dollar, I spent it. Unfortunately, we forgot our keys. So introduction fragments can be longer, like when I found a dollar, or they can be as short as a single word, like unfortunately. To be really good at using this rule, you need to be good at two things. First, identifying if you have an introduction fragment, and two, figuring out where the introduction fragment meets the full sentence. So we're going to talk about how to be good at these two things. We're going to start with number one, identifying if you have an introduction fragment. So introduction fragments have a tendency to start with specific kinds of words. So they start with words ending in L-Y, I-N-G, and E-D. They start with dependent words like when, if, as, because. Or they start with prepositions like uh, under, over, after, things like that. We're going to focus on each kind of those words so that you know what I'm talking about and are prepared to recognize when your sentence starts with one of these kinds of words. So words ending in L-Y-I-N-G-E-D. Those are easier to spot. So some examples. Luckily for me, I had packed an extra pair of shoes. So luckily ends in L-Y. So I knew that that was an introduction fragment or it started with an introduction fragment. Two, running late, Cosmo had to go without his morning latte run. So running, I-N-G, I knew that I had an introduction fragment. The last example, surprised by the stray dog, Joe ran away as, fa as fast as possible. So it ended with ED. So you knew that that started an introduction fragment. Those are pretty easy to identify. Dependent words, you've already been practicing recognizing when you have dependent words. So the example, when frightened, my dog hides in the closet. When is a dependent word, so you know that that starts an introduction fragment. Or two, if I want to leave town, there's a lot of work I need to get done quickly. If is a dependent word. So get used to spotting those dependent words. When, if, as, because, those are the really common ones to watch out for. All right, prepositions. Prepositions are words that indicate how one thing is in relation to something else. So it indicates how it is in relation to something else, in relation to time, location, direction. So here are some examples. After the storm, the air smelled wonderfully clean. So after is a preposition. And so we know that we have an introduction fragment. The second one, until I get paid, I can't afford to buy that. Until is a preposition. So we know to watch for it. So here are some common prepositions in this list. Um, I see after, before, behind, beneath, from, uh, let's see, since, under, until. So you just have to get used to watching for those kind of preposition words. So really, it's getting a sense of, this is all about getting a sense of when you have an introduction fragment, is watching for these words that tend to start introductions, uh, fragments. 
So now that we've talked about what we need to be good at, the first thing we need to be good at, which is identifying if you have an introduction fragment, we're going to talk about number two, which is figuring out where the introduction fragment meets the full sentence. So that boundary is really important because once you have determined where the introduction fragment ends, uh, you can put a comma. And so you need to test and see whether you've identified where, correctly identified where the introduction fragment ends. And the way to test for that is to do some covering up to check and see if you are still left with the parts you need. So remember that pattern is we have an introduction fragment and then a full sentence. Once you think you've been, um, found the introduction fragment, cover it up and see if you're left with a full sentence. If you're left with a full sentence, then you've probably correctly identified the introduction fragment. And just to be super safe, cover up the full sentence. Make sure that what you're left with, that introduction part, is really actually a fragment. If it is, you found the right place to put that comma. So this is what it looks like. We're gonna test this sentence. Inside the gym was decorated and ready for the dance. This sentence tricks a lot of people because they're not sure where the boundary is between the introduction fragment and the full sentence. There are two places that people think it is, after inside or after gym. So we're gonna use this test to see which one is correct. We're gonna first check to see if it goes after gym. So we're gonna cover up what we think is the introduction fragment. And we're left with, was decorated and ready for the dance. That's a fragment, we're missing a subject. So we did not identify the right boundary or the place where the fragment and full sentence touched. So let's try the other one. We'll cover up inside and see if we're left with the full sentence. The gym was decorated and ready for the dance. We have a full sentence. So it follows the pattern we need. So it means that we insert a comma at the boundary between the introduction fragment and the full sentence. All right, we're on to rule number two for the week. This one is actually easy. Understanding why it's important is a little bit trickier. But when you have a series, which is a fancy word for a list of three or more items, you need to put commas between those items in a list. So examples, I bought milk, bread, and eggs. We have three things in that list, milk, bread, and eggs, and we're going to separate them with the commas. And the second one, pizzas, tacos, and cake are my favorite food. Pizzas, tacos, cake, three items, we're putting commas in between. The list can happen anywhere in a sentence, but most commonly they're at the beginning or the end. So you just have to watch, do I have a list? Do I have at least three things in my list? If I do, I need to use commas between all the parts. So when you're writing or you're editing someone's essay and you're trying to decide where do I put these commas in the list, it can be kind of tricky because lists can get pretty long. Um, the parts of the list are going to help you figure out um, where they stop and start. Because if it's a good list, it should be parallel in structure, meaning that the parts of the list should either start in the same way, contain similar types of things, and or follow some pattern. This pattern is important, and that should help you find the parts of the list. So I have this tricky list for us to work on. I was late to work today because my kids flushed a washcloth down the toilet, played hide and seek instead of brushing their teeth and dressed the baby up as a wizard. That's a long sentence. So where do we start picking things out to figure out the pieces of the list? Well, honestly, the easiest way to do this is to look for the and and then look at the last part of the list. Dress the baby up as a wizard. Okay, it starts with an ED word, and then what they dressed and who they dressed up. Okay, let's see if we can back up and find something similar. 
played hide and seek instead of brushing their teeth. Wait a minute. So that starts with an ED verb. Maybe that's our list. I'll back up. Oh, we have another ED verb. That's probably our pattern. So I identify those places. Yeah, the pattern is that the list starts with past tense verbs. And so once you identify that, you put commas between the parts of the list. So does that comma actually matter? And it depends who you're talking to. It matters to me. So in this class, it matters to you. But it really does matter. Now, the sciences are starting to phase out that comma. Newspapers phase out that comma. They feel that it saves space, it saves ink, and it saves money because it saves space and ink. So they get rid of it. But the truth is that comma makes a big difference in clarity of meaning. It actually has a fancy name. It's called the Oxford comma. So after this lesson, you're going to know what an Oxford comma is, and you're going to know something that makes you super fancy. All right. So this comma, this Oxford comma, do I have to put it in there? Well, yes. So one day I am going to win an award, and this is my award speech. I would like to thank my parents, Elton John and Lady Gaga. So that comma between Elton John and Lady Gaga, why does it need to be there? Because it changes the meaning. So we're going to look at what it means when you include the comma. So I would like to thank my parents, comma, Elton John, comma, and Lady Gaga. This comma is a signal to the reader that this is the last part of a list and that it is a list of multiple individual things. In this case, it's a list of three entities. My parents, number one, Elton John, number two, Lady Gaga, number three. Okay, so that's how we usually read it. But here's the funny, interesting part. If you leave that comma out, you're not telling me you have a list anymore. What you're telling me is this last part, it's not a list. What it's doing is it is renaming what came before, which is my parents. So by leaving that comma out, you are actually saying, I would like to thank my parents, who are Elton John and Lady Gaga, which would be awesome, but weird, and not what I meant. So that comma matters. So we're going to practice using it. So go ahead, pull up the exercises, and... Get to inserting commas, but only where they're needed.